Malaya, one of the richest countries of Southeast Asia, occupying a strategic position at the vital crossroads of East and West, for centuries it has been the meeting place for travelers. They came to trade, many stayed to settle, and they flourished. Much of the country is covered by a thick blanket of impenetrable forest. Running down its spine is a long mountain range where numerous rivers begin their winding course down to the sea. In the coastal plains lie the paddy fields. Rice is the staple diet of the people, the food alike for Malays, Chinese and Indians who give Malaya its vitality. But rubber is the main prop of Malaya's economic well-being. Grown on nearly four million acres, the industry provides the livelihood of more than a million people of all races living in the country. Next to rubber is tin, of which Malaya is the world's largest producer. One third of the world's tin output comes from Malaya, from its open cast mines, its dredges. These two primary industries have brought Malaya great wealth. Malaya's six million people, Malays, Chinese, Indians and others, have a long tradition of living together in peace and harmony, each contributing something of their character to the multiracial community that is Malaya today. During the early post-war years, as Malaya gradually returned to normal, the Malayan communists made a bid to seize power. The grim spectre of international communism hovered over our fair land. Then it happened. Hi YouTube, welcome back to another video. Um, I'm sorry it's been such a long time again, that's been about a month or so since I did my last video on um, British Army in Northern Ireland in <coughs> So today's video is going to be um, regarding British Army in Malaya between uh, 1948 and 1960 when independence was given over to the Malayan government. Um, so the premise of the Indonesian, uh, sorry, the um, Malayan emergency was basically a communist uprising by, um, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name, I can't remember the guy, uh, gentleman's name on the top of my head who led the communist um, insurgency against uh, governmental and um, British forces. <coughs> so basically, in this one we're depicting a member of the Royal Hampshire Rint out in Malaya. Um, they were out there around about 1954. And I think before that as well, I can't remember exactly the right years they were out there, but I'll put add on a short clip either before or after this main part um, regarding the history of the regiment in Malaya. Just to note, there are um, rack, there are unit slides on the epaulets which would not be worn whilst out on patrol, but they're on there just to sig um, signify the um, unit that is being portrayed. And the ones that are on there aren't exactly the right type. I'm waiting on a um, um, a friend to uh, make up some sets of the uh, um, um, slip-on titles, basically, for said unit. <coughs> so going from top to bottom, uh, we have the standard bush hat of the British Army, sort of post-war. That was most iconic of uh, troops in the tropics. Um, for, for example, like in... Uh, as it is Malaya um, and Borneo and places to that effect um, and also quite iconic seeing um, guys um, who were uh, test subjects let's say for the um, nuclear test trials around Christmas Island and places like that they're all wearing these and basically not much else which is um, quite a big uh, let's just say horrible thing in the whole matter but moving as I said so bush hat um, large brim, <coughs> depending on sort of which type and sort of the era. Fairly deep, with um, slotted pockets all the way around, and then obviously later in the in the um, um, in Borneo in the Indonesian confrontation, 
um, <coughs> you will see white cord wrapped around which will be used for markers for ambushes and things like that. But generally in Malaya you would have um, different coloured bands or different coloured patches denoting um, uh, units or certain uh, time period you were in um, whilst on patrol um, to signify your patrol spe um, specifically so to um, have less of a uh, jumping from uh, communist guerrillas um, trying to infiltrate your patrol or your camp <coughs> so to lower the risk of that basically moving on to the bush jackets so this is a 1949 made bush jacket sort of a post-war um, pattern just the post-war, uh, sort of immediate post-war pattern um, sort of talking about sort of very very late war ones as well um, so the four main pockets um, two, the top two are buttoned down and the lower two are just general flap down. Um, some items that have been added are the uh, put on, uh, female popper studs on just above the pocket here and on the arms so you could attach things like I'm guessing metal ribbons I'm not sure for like parade or unit patches on this arm. This one, this one is there as a large couple on both arms. Very very nice garment and um, very very comfortable and uh, very very robust and obviously there's a lot of sweat stains on the back so this has been quite heavily used as you can guess. Um, <coughs> the equipment is majority well is primarily made up almost completely of 1944 pattern um, equipment um, with the main basic pouches, um, belt, um, two canteens, one slung on the belt. The other um, hooked onto the O-ring, the O-rings um, on the uh, haversack um, or first pattern pack, I should really say. Um, and let me just remove the uh, stang gun, and I'll uh, show you the main bit itself. So, as you can see, two main pouches. Um, these ones are containing Sten magazines, um, obviously because he's carrying a, and the gentleman's carrying a Sten gun. Um, in the bayonet uh, pocket on the side of the left hand pouch, um, which will be sort of an attribute carried over to the 58 pattern weapon, um, <coughs> is a number 7 bayonet, which um, I sort of mixed it around and I wanted sort of like a, a place for me to put it, so I thought oh, this would be quite a good. Um, uh, want to try it on. Um, generally, obviously, it doesn't fit onto the Sten, but um, obviously, fits onto the standard number four rifle or onto the Mark V Sten. Um, <coughs> obviously, with the attachment of the earlier number four style bayonet. Um, the bayonet was n never was pr practically never really used in combat at all. I've just put it in here, sort of a pocket filler, as I wanted someone to short shot off, but. It is used a lot in ceremonial duties, especially um, footage of um, the 1st Battalion Hampshire Regiment in Malaya. Um, <clears throat> I think in very, very, the very, very early 50s, as far as I can see from the actual footage. But um, with uh, number four rifles and um, the number seven bayonets. So I think I've shown the previous video, but I cannot remember. So number seven is a. Uh, Different kind of it sort of takes most of its style from the uh, um, well the number five bayonet, number five rifle bayonet, and in the way of like the large O-ring and the uh, sort of Bakelite hand or large, but it has a different fixture. Obviously, to go on the number four and the number five, um, so the number four rifle and the, num and the uh, Mark V Sten, sorry, um, it takes a different sort of like locking mechanism. So a normal sort of uh, twist plug, almost um, sort of socket bayonet style as before, but obviously to fit on this style of um, bayonet it has a locking lug you push forward and it locks around but with a sort of um, uh, sort of slight miscon sort of missing well bad really design really um, apart from sort of ceremonial duties really in combat it's a very very uh, more of a hindrance than a help really to the uh, fire it's more of a danger to the to the user than to the actual target it's being aimed at really in the way of like um, the o-ring could obstruct and the um, 
the latch almost as like a ramp to the round that comes out if it's if it catches it that is so uh, especially with something like a sten gun um, there's probably a possibility with a burst you're probably going to hit the o-ring the um, and probably injure yourself really in doing it but on the end of a rifle it does look quite you know, intimidating and quite nice as like a um, uh, ceremonial um, aspect of the bayonet but apart from that as a fighting knife they're, they're very very good got a nice long grip and um, with the extra sort of lug for the handle it gives you a nice long and sort of a nice sort of bottom plate to sort of uh, do some damage with and as a as a bowie blade style it is and if sharpened which you weren't really supposed to do with bayonets in, in, in general really um, could be done um, made quite effective and the large o-ring makes quite a nice um, cross guard but as a, as a blade itself it's very very nice and obviously this design excuse me this general design in any way obviously does well on the number five but also the blade itself will be carried over to the SLR um, in later life so I'll just plop that back in <coughs> as I said two main basic pouches both carrying um, several magazines for the Sten gun um, and this is a Mark II Sten, um, this one that, that was being carried um, so obviously sort of um, much, well, less favourable especially then as compared to say the Mark V Sten which had some wood furniture which is a little bit more hairy, heavier but a little bit more comfortable say to um, handle and, and use for long periods of time even if it was slightly heavier but then you have the introduction of the sterling um, slightly later to the conflict say the early to the late 50s um, and obviously with the um, with the phasing out of say the number five with the number four and number five rifles um, for basically with the introduction of the SLR um, very much later into the conflict say around 57 58 and then with 59 being a more sort of widespread use of it but obviously mainly um, the SLR has seen most combat sort of in that sort of area of operations away of the South Pacific in the way of the Pacific in um, or Southeast Asia to say really um, of like Borneo and places like that <coughs> but this one is on the Malaya so we'll carry on with this so as I said two more passages with the uh, magazines in um, sometimes you'll see generally one one pack will be filled with ammunition, say maybe brain gun magazine, obviously for the squad, um, brain gun, a um, couple of magazines for yourself if you say we're using a submachine gun of that type, or some bat or possibly some bandoliers for your rifle if you were using one. Um, <coughs> the other one may the other pouch may be filled with other accoutrement, other accoutrements, maybe cooking wise and things to that extent. I just spin it around to its side. Normally I would do a little cut, but it's I've got to hold up really so I can't really be moving around all the time. So move the side as you can see the lance corporal stripe on the side, and probably a bit more better the Royal Hampshire um, sh um, slip on title. Obviously the um, proper ones <coughs> would be roughly sorry about that would be roughly this size, but um, of black background with I believe it's yellow writing with two coloured strips on the top and bottom of the slide denoting which company um, you were part of um, so different colours denote different companies <coughs> so coming down the side you can see probably in the bottom is the 1944 canteen with the uh, missile cap so denoting sort of very early sort of uh, period of the uh, of the conflict but um, the one at the back does have a later rubber cap so it's um, um, so I would say sort of coming to sort of mid fifties at this period it sort of shows. So yeah, 1944 canteen uh, and cover, um, very very good. Um, and the canteen covers themselves were um, and the canteens in some ways as well were carried over and used for a very very long time, well up until well um, almost the nineties really, um, because they're very very useful. And quite and quite good general use items. That's that, and then this um, uh, sort of strap with um, lifter dots fastener um, was there for the stock of the rifle. So when slung over the shoulder, 
the stock of the rifle could be here sort of ease it and stop it from moving about all the time. And if I just spin it around again, <coughs> you can see the haversack. So on the back we have an extra canteen um, for the per for the individual, so to have more water. Obviously you're in a jungle environment, it's very hot, very humid. Um, yes, there is quite typical a lot of rainfall, but at the end of the day, humidity is quite almost unbearable to live in when you haven't got um, water to drink. Um, in the side pockets of the haversack, you have extra supplies, possibly maybe some extra ammunition or um, certain things to sustain yourself in the jungle, like certain sterilization tablets. But um, some of those could be in the main um, compartment itself. In the main compartment, oh, there is this gentleman. Well, it's been set up with extra socks, um, uh, food, so with the rations um, for a short period. So this is a three-day patrol. Um, so you yeah, have to prevent it for about um, uh, two and a half to three days in this pack. Obviously, um, water here and uh, other guys will carry sort of more water for themselves, etc. I would sort of aim in general for this gentleman to carry possibly another canteen or another two canteens for this sort of patrol. Um, as I said, extra socks, extra underwear, um, your, um, your shaving wash kit is in there too because you want to be keeping clean whilst on patrol because you don't want bad things to sort of set in, like on your feet for example, especially with the boots that are issued, or probably only really last the patrol in those three days, especially with the conditions sometimes if it's been heavy rainfall, um, especially in Malaya, especially you'll see those sort of attributes in Borneo um, during the mid 60s. Um, so as I said, wash kits in there, so knife, fork, spoon, soap, shaving kit, etc. of the sort of um, later post-war um, uh, aluminium designs uh, for the wash kit, um, which were introduced during the war, but were not issued until before, and were not issued really, um, but were issued to guys who were going out to the Far East, but never got there until after the bombs were dropped. So we never actually seen news and see and never saw combat in that way um, during the war. Uh, but even so, people during the reenactment community tend to use those things um, in, say, guys in Northwest Europe in 1944, um, which makes no sense whatever because they, they yeah they might have been made in 1944 and 1945, but they never saw combat until probably um, Korea or even Malaya. <coughs> um, Probably the layer because it kicked off in 48. But yeah, so underneath I've got a um, roll which normally be sort of sleeping kit. Um, I have a, um, it's sort of, sort of like a sort of a makeshift thing at the moment just to fill in this gap. But generally it'd be like a bed roll or something sleep wise or anything like that. Um, I have a flask here, um, so with hot water so it stays on boiling. Um, thinged up and then wrapped up to insulate to keep it hot. Um, so they can quickly make a brew on the move. Um, I have got that from a um, thing from my dad when I was talking to him. My dad, my granddad, when he was in Malaya, always carried a flask which with fresh boiled, boiled water and kept it on him most of the time. Even though most of the time he wasn't really on patrol, um, but when they went on short, um, well, they do go on patrol sometimes with the Royal Engineers. So on patrol sometimes he generally tried to keep boiled water on him at all times. So he didn't have to um, brew up whilst out on patrol. Um, so that's that. Um, if you have other things, please let me know. But that's what I'm um, from experience that I've been told um, for my own grandfather. Um, so obviously other essential items, um, surplus to requirement really, well not surplus to requirement, but on the individual person itself or on the patrol you're going on or on um, whatever your commanding officer has said at the time to be carried or wherever you're going. Um, spinning it around again. So, just pull this round. We have the machete on this side. Um, this is a wartime uh, machete. So if you can just see, this is a wartime machete. I'll just get it out for you. So wartime machete. Uh, this one is noted to go to a gentleman, third division. Um, three on the bottom of the uh, scabbard here. And there's a third division insignia um, uh, stamped on the back of the uh, scabbard itself. 
It's a very nice one. Normally, um, jet guys will be using either similar ones to these or the, uh, I think it's the Golok uh, Machete um, later within the Malayan conflict and then into Borneo. But still, as it goes, these machetes were in very, very common use around this turret period, especially with the early part of the conflict, um, because so many were made and so many were used, especially out in um, the Far East, and also some were used by guys in North West Europe as well, for general purpose use, really, for like wood chopping, etc. But obviously, you're in a dense jungle, bushwise, it's going to take people, like, for instance, somewhere in North West Europe, you can walk a couple of miles in an hour or so, to walk that distance in the jungle, it will take you a couple of days. Um, so it's um, quite a tiring, tiring job to really do. So that's the machete. It's a very, very nice one, as I said. Um, a little bit of damage on the handle here and there, but apart from that, it's uh, in fairly good nick. The, uh, the strap on the uh, scabbard is, is worn a little bit, but in general, the blade itself is in really, really nice nick, and the scabbard is still quite um, neat out. Okay, let me just put that back in there. So, excuse me. Okay, there we go. So yeah, same again as the other side. So I said about the studs, the unit patches, the dance corporal stripe, and then you can see the side view of the um, haversack small pack, um, well, first pack, uh, first um, model, first model pack, sorry, words, canteen, and then the roll underneath, which is the, um, in this case, it's the insulated uh, flask for uh, hot water. But generally, it would be, um, <coughs> like, bed kit-wise, but I don't really have any, like, bed kit um, of this period really yet, which I'll have to see in getting in. But, as I said, my grandfather carried a flask, but he wasn't on patrol, but he carried it all where he went, so he could make up a brew whenever he could, really. Um, spin this round again, back to the front, and then we'll wrap up the video. So, um, just want to show you off this kit because of this something I've been building up on um, throughout the year. Myself and another fellow reenactor are um, building up on a uh, Malay mainly Malaya, and then going sort of into Borneo in impression for um, certain events next year. Um, primarily with um, Hat Green, we'll be doing um, Malaya hopefully. <clears throat> um, and little bits here and there gathering up, so I've been able to get some more small kit, um, trousers and boots. So I managed to um, procure some um, um, boots from um, uh, Australia, which is really good. So that's that. I'm from a company over there, so they're really, it was a bit of a hassle with um, customers. That the company themselves were really, really nice though. So that's that. Um, yeah, so thank you again for watching. A um, little bit of a short video. Well, well, about 22 minutes now, so, so not too short. But I thought I will put in something because it's been a while since my last video. And um, I did plan to do this a couple of weeks ago, but just never got the chance to. So, in case of uh, just getting things done, really. But yeah. So that's that for this video. Any questions, and if I've missed anything out, which I no doubt you have, um, please put them in the comments below. And thank you so, so much, or to say a quick thank you to Rifle, so Simon from the Rifle More and More channel, who was, has been so kind. Obviously, I sent, I sent him some bits recently. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I sent him over some bits a couple of weeks ago. Um, as just like a little gift thing. Because uh, they were sort of surplus to requirement for me, really. Um, some didn't fit me and I didn't really have some use for some other things and I thought as a general nice gift for some other bits as well um, and he has very, very kindly done a couple of shout outs within that um, video and other times within other videos as well and it's brought a, quite, a few new yeah, quite a few new people over to the channel which is very very helpful um, and very very kind of him so I really really appreciate that um, and I am very appreciative of and Welcome and hello to this crazed and slightly slow and upload channel um, with my rambling self. Um, to the new, all the new people, I have Tourette's, so I do have some little breaks here and there sometimes, as you've probably seen during this video. Um, so yeah, and sort of a, with the whole move, there's some bits which, obviously with the new room, move around with 
this being the room. Um, <clears throat> operationally, it's very different, and since the move, I cannot find my tripod, so I'm having to balance this right on my TV <laughs> at the moment. And lighting is a bit bad because the lighting in the room has currently blown, so um, uh, the actual wiring is a bit fried. So that's we're having someone to come and replace that. Hopefully next week. So that's all dependent on what's going to go on. So yeah, that's that's a bit of a iffy bit, but yeah. Again, thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it, and see you again soon. Bye. Son, you gotta work late Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do But there ain't no cure for the summertime blues Oh, well, my mom and papa told me Son, you gotta make some money now, If you wanna use a car to go a ride next Sunday Oh, well, I didn't go to work Told the boss I was sick Now you can't use a car Cause you didn't work or live Sometimes I wonder What I'm gonna do But there ain't no cure For the summertime blues I'm gonna take two weeks Gonna have a fun vacation I'm gonna take my problem To the United Nations well, I called my congressman and he said, quote, I'd like to help you, son, but you're too young to vote. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do, but there ain't no cure for the summertime blues.